Welcome back. The world's latest weapon against COVID-19 is a bivalent vaccine developed by Moderna that looks to make its global debut in the UK in early September. For more on this, I have Dr. Kim Singtek from Institute Pasteur Korea. Dr. Kim, it's really good to see you again. Good afternoon. Good to be back. I also have Professor David Kwok from Sunchang University. Professor Kwok, it's great to have you here as well. Thanks for having me. Right, Dr. Kim, we'll start with you then. Let's begin with what a bivalent vaccine is. Well, I have to start with the as a monovalent vaccine first, and it just is specifically regarding the COVID-19 vaccine series. The, uh, the the vaccine that we have used so far is a so, so-called monovalent vaccine, which was actually just a vaccine developed to just uh, produce the uh, or just uh, giving just a uh, uh, spike protein, uh, ex or actually expressed from the anc ancestral SARS-CoV-2, which was actually identified almost now just uh, well, two years ago in Wuhan, China. So based on the, the sequence information. But now, the, as you know, the, uh, the viruses have just mutated and then generated a lot of just uh, sort of just variants. And one of the concerns is the many variants are seems to just evade just uh, our just uh, immune interest responses, especially just antibody responses. So then the people and then scientists actually just uh, try to come up with the, uh, some uh, better vaccine the formulation, especially the uh, generate the, uh, the spike protein against the uh, new variant. So then the, this is so so bivalent vaccine is sort of just the, the first outcome of such a, just an effort. So uh, the Moderna and then the Pfizer now just they uh, develop the, the bivalent vaccine, which is basically just to express the uh both just the spike protein. One is from the ancestral SARS-CoV-2, which is actually the Wuhan virus, just in information. And the, the second one is actually just the Omicron variant, not just Omicron BA4 and 5, but earlier is the BA1. So the uh, so the, basically the outcome from the uh, this uh, the sort of just a very simple just a trial is that uh, well as expected the uh, the neutralizing antibody titer is increased compared to this uh, monovalent vaccine. It's a, but it's about just a 1.7 fold. So it's kind of expected, but we do not know exactly what the clinical sig significance of this uh, just increase is. Because uh, when you actually just uh, reflect on the uh, some uh, past experience, especially the uh, the first vaccine development by the Pfizer and the Moderna, the uh, neutralizing anti neutralizing antibody titer was actually two, two twice more for the uh, some uh, the Moderna vaccine. That's kind of uh, expected because the uh, Moderna vaccine actually we are actually injecting 100 microgram of RNA, but the Pfizer vaccine is a 30 microgram of RNA. So although the neutralizing antibody was higher with the uh, Moderna Moderna just vaccine, but when you actually look at the uh, some uh, clinical just uh, outcome. The, the protection efficiency was almost identical. So the uh, so, uh, neutralizing antibody levels does not directly translate it into any just a clinical just a efficacy. So that, well, anyway, just a, but I think just a sort of just increasing neutralizing, uh, neutralizing antibody level seems to just, uh, just confer more uh, protection, especially just a protection against the, uh, the infection. But we will see the, uh, some, any some clinical significance in the later. Right, I see. Mm -hmm. And Professor, Quack, can this particular vaccine be taken as a primary vaccine for those who have yet to be inoculated, or does it simply serve as a booster? I think for the time being, it'll serve only as a booster shot. Uh, the reason being, as uh, uh, Dr. Kim was mentioning, uh, this, the study that we base our indications on have only studied it as a booster. Uh, we have not actually in inoculated this particular mixture of vaccines uh, to people who have not been vaccinated before. That also might be due to the fact that uh, a, a huge portion of the population, global population that is now, have already been inoculated with at least one or two shots in the prior. So that being said, theoretically speaking and scientifically uh, deducing, I think it'll be possible even with this mixture of vaccine can be inoculated into a person who have not been inoculated priorly, but at least for the time being, because we have to scientifically base on only a strong proof that it can be safely done so, it, currently it is only indicated at being used as only boosters. Also, if I may mention, this particular study has covered uh, the, the study of this bivalent vaccine that is, has covered 
people who, who are above 18 years of age, and it also added prior studies that have studied the original strains of uh, vaccines that were uh, fighting against the original strains of the, the SARS-CoV-2. So that being said, I think there's also a great chance going into the near future rather than the longer future. Uh, I think we might be able to see more indications that diverge from the only uh, indication that we have as inoculating in adults only. Right, I see. Dr. Kim, the UK, like I mentioned at the start, will become the first country to roll out Moderna's bivalent vaccine on September 5th, to be precise. Now, this is ahead of a much-anticipated resurgence in autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. That being said, do you suppose Korea should also seek to promptly approve this new vaccine, or should we seek to follow the progress made in the UK? I think it's a currently just a global trend, including just the UK and US, kind of just shifting to just some updated vaccine formulation, whether some uh, experts are not strongly just agreed just with this idea. But anyway, we will just follow the, uh, this global trend. But I, I don't really, uh, I don't know if whether it is a good idea to seek the, any just a prompt approval like just the UK, because uh, as, uh, as I said earlier, uh, this uh, all the clinical trials is based on some uh, neutralizing antibody titers, not really just uh, and the clinical significance and also the any potential adverse effects. So I think in this case, we should just, uh, just uh, well, maybe just we, we can just a uh, little bit just uh, wait and uh, see what the outcome from the uh, the UK case and also what is important thing is that uh, even the the vaccine that we are using right now the based on the ancestral virus is still very good especially protecting just against the severe diseases. Right, I see. Professor Quark, in the meantime then, what has been shared about the possible side effects of this bivalent vaccine? Well, as it could be expected already, because this is not a vastly different type of vaccine, but rather it's a uh, vaccine carrying the same mechanism except the genomic codon that designates the, the antibody to fight against the new strains of the, the original virus. Uh, not much is really different uh, from what we used to have with the original types of vaccines. That is namely, obviously, the most common side effect would be the inflammation and slight pain on the shot or the side of the arm that was uh, uh, inoculated with the vaccine, but also, as we have commonly experienced, uh, side effects such as muscle pain, side effects such as slight fever, uh, such as um, um, joint pains, and, and for some people it could have been nausea, but also, namely, uh, uh, the side effects also still includes that uh, possibility of myocarditis. Uh, those are all listed in the uh, inoculation guideline that was uh, contained with the new uh, bivalent vaccine. Uh, and once, I, uh, once again, that I want to emphasize it's primarily because it's not a new type of vaccine, but rather a mixture of the same mechanism vaccine that carries two different genomic codons. So it'll still be able to fight against two different types of variants, but through the mechanism, it's using the same type of mechanism that we used to have uh, before with the, with the original strain of the vaccine as well. Right. Uh, Dr. Kim, Professor Kwok just mentioned myocarditis, and staying with that, I understand the risk of myocarditis is higher mm -hmm. after COVID-19 infection rather than COVID-19 inoculation. Could you tell us more about this particular research? Well, that result was uh, kind of just observed among the, uh, some clinicians, I mean, even before very recent uh, just the uh, publication, that, that uh, one actually just uh, recently just published by the uh, journal called Circulation, and then they actually observed uh, such kind of just effect, in, I mean, just uh, so the frequency of the myocarditis, more frequent just myocarditis from the unvaccinated COVID-19 patient. So myocarditis is uh, one of just actually complication, even just the uh, infection or just the vaccination, but the frequency is higher with the uh, unvaccinated, which means actually the, the vaccination is uh, the better choice for that. And then the, this, uh, the investigator actually just following the number of people, including just uh, vaccinees from the vaccines from the AstraZeneca, Pfizer vaccine, and the Moderna vaccine. There are some, uh, some minor differences, especially the, uh, the recipients of Moderna vaccines. But generally, they actually just, uh, uh, just, uh, got a, just, uh, just uh, have uh, some conclusion that uh, myocarditis is more frequent, especially in the uh, some, uh, unvaccinated COVID-19 patients compared to the, the vaccinated people. Right, and staying with vaccinations, Professor Kwok, U.S. health authorities, that is, this week approved Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine for those aged 12 to 17. Now, this approval follows South Korea's own green light earlier this month. What can you tell us about this particular vaccine? 
Um, let me actually point out uh, one fact here that uh, we, I don't think our, uh, Korea has yet permitted Novavax uh, vaccine to uh, those aged between 12 and 17 in Korea yet. So they're not exactly following the age limits uh, towards the vaccine, but they're actually allowing these uh, younger uh, generations to be inoculated with the vaccine. It is very safe uh, vaccine to use. Uh, so I'm going to mention uh, some of the few benefits that we can gain from this. So Novavax uses a, uh, a mechanism that's called a, a recombinant protein types, which has already been used in different types of vaccines against influenza and many other diseases and has already proven to be completely safe to use. So it has that huge benefit over the other newer types of uh, vaccines that use newer mechanisms that there are millions of cases that, uh, that prove that it is a perfectly safe uh, machinery to use against this particular virus. That's number one. Number two, uh, it also uses uh, a mechanism called adjuvant, and namely it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a chemical called saponin that utilizes our own bodily system that enhances the immune reaction to this particular protein that's being inoculated inside our body. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that when this inoculation exposes this hand part of the virus into our body, the saponin part, the, the adjuvant part, enhances our body's reaction so that we can build better and more efficient antibodies against this particular hand. I want to mention one, another note on this matter is that SK Biosciences vaccine also uh, similarly follows this method of mechanism utilizing the vaccine uh, mechanism. So Novavax and SK Bioscience shares a very closely related mechanism in their um, um, uh, enabling the bodies to come up with antibodies and also enhancing our body's immune system to come up with those antibodies. So Novavax is, let's, uh, I want to emphasize that it is very safe machinery to use as a vaccine. Uh, just yet, we have not allowed ourselves, uh, those in between ages of 12 to 17, to be inoculated with it yet. I actually suggested to my parents to be inoculated with the, this particular vaccine. They had no side effects whatsoever after the inoculation and were very happy with it. So if those, uh, there are people who are worried about from their prior uh, experiences uh, of side effects from uh, receiving vaccines, I suggest Novavax could be a very uh, good alternative choice. I see. Well, that is good to know. Dr. Kim, moving beyond vaccines now, in response to concerns about the possible emergence of new variants, mm -hmm. some health experts claim that such possibility is now low. Do you agree? Well, personally, I think that this is, uh, that's pretty much it's just a pre premature conclusion. Well, the uh, coronavirus, this is uh, the RNA virus, which means it contains the RNA as a genetic material. And RNA virus is known to have just uh, so many just mutation. But that does not mean it, that does not mean that the virus just uh, uh, just uh, uh, mutating just uh, forever. I mean, there is a certain some uh, genetic just uh, barriers. But I think within the uh, genetic barrier, the RNA virus seems to find a very smart way to just evade. I mean, just uh, uh, just find a way. Maybe just uh, evade maybe uh, drug select dr drug selection or like uh, antibody selection pressures. And then at this moment, I have to be. I have to say. I, we, have, we have to be very careful that the, the virus does not mutate anymore. I mean, th there's still just a potential to find a way just, just out-compete out the some current, current variant. Right, I see. Professor Kwok, there is new data analysis which has been shared online that claims regular physical exercise reduces the chances of COVID-19 infection as well as severity. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's rather a logical sense that a regular exercise will protect us from any infectious diseases. Priorly, the same journal uh, that printed out this study uh, last year, namely, actually uh, made a study that proved people who are lacking in exercises were actually more prone to getting COVID-19 more severely. So this is exactly the opposite uh, um, uh, direction in, in, that it took in the study. What it mainly proved was that for those people who exercise more than 150 minutes in a week, uh, were 11 percent less likely to get infected with COVID-19 in the first place, but more importantly, they were protected up to 36% more in being admitted to the hospital and then 
43% more from dying from COVID-19. But there were multiples of more studies that were priorly done that actually proved regular exercises protected people against having respiratory illnesses, other infectious type of diseases. This particular study was rather meta-analysis, so it did not directly recruit people to be studied through a, a thorough measurement and everything, but it actually studied results of multiples of different studies in the same fashion. And it accumulated about 1.8 million people, so this the important factor in there that the study uh, mass was very huge. It proves further that if we, uh, if we regularly exercise, boost up our immune system, uh, uh, keep our metabolism healthy, we will be less likely to be in, uh, uh, affected with the infectious disease. Right, so all the more reason to go back to the gym then. Mm -hmm. right? It was published by the British Journal of uh, Sports Medicine. Uh, staying with uh, research, Dr. Kim, Canadian researchers have reportedly mm -hmm. discovered an element that is apparently consistent across um, variants. Could you tell us more about this finding as well, its implications? Well, uh, not even just uh, the COVID-19, the, the SARS-CoV-2, there have been many just uh, much interest in terms of uh, developing a sort of just uh, universal vaccines, regardless of all sorts of just variants and also some sort of uh, pan uh, broad spectrum antiviral, and in this case, pan coronavirus inhibitors or so pan SARS-CoV-2 antiviral drugs. So the, the investigate, it, this has been just a long investigate, um, not only just uh, these uh, the scientists, but other scientists. So the one thing is that uh, we have used uh, some monoclonal antibody, including our just a Korean Celtrium monoclonal antibody. But the, the thing that we have observed so far is uh, so, some of the earlier monoclonal antibody was pretty successful. They were actually very effective against the uh, preventing the severe disease like uh, 70 or 80 percent. But then the, the problem is, uh, uh, since we are talking about some variant, when the variance actually emerges, some of the monoclonal antibodies substantially lost their neutralizing capacity. So they are not recommended anymore for just a new variant. So then the the question is that the, the so, so scientists uh, come up with the, uh, some, uh, uh, some monoclonal antibody that is actually work regardless of the variants. So mo many of the, uh, the monoclonal antibodies that actually show that there's a, loss, there's a substantial loss of neutral capacity actually target some specific region of the spike protein which actually change it after some emergence of a variant. So, but there are some region which is very conserved. We got among, among the old the, the variants of the SARS-CoV-2 and also some other some coronaviruses. So the scientists actually found one such uh, the region, and then they suggested if we can develop the, uh, some monoclonal antibody against this region, then we can actually just uh, can just uh, generate some uh, one of the uh, potent antiviral drugs, regardless of any emergence of a potential just uh, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 variant. So that's the point. Right, a very promising finding then, of course. Yeah, it is. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Kim, as always, thank you very much for your mm -hmm. time and your thoughts. And Professor Kwok, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.